Greetings, everyone. We're uh, embarking on our lecture on trauma, burn management, mass casualty, and biological warfare. So we're move on to anesthesia and burn injury management. So, uh, diffuse coagulopathy resulting from transfusion of nearly one and a half blood volumes of packed red blood cells reflects dilution of which of the following? The correct answer in this case is fibrinogen. Um, after nearly one and a half blood volumes, that you start to develop a hyperfibrinogenemia, and that's where you start developing your diffuse microvascular bleeding tendency with um, large-scale blood transfusion. With two blood volumes, you start depleting factors. With two and a half blood volumes, you start depleting platelets in that order. So uh, in this particular clinical stem, you have a 37-year-old male with a history of drug abuse, and he's rescued from a burning apartment with 50% third-degree burns along the neck, uh, arm, and chest. He's alert and oriented. Uh, he's tachycardic and hypertensive, and you're called to the emergency room to aid in airway management. So what do you need to think about? So first of all, in terms of classifying burns, you can classify them according to total body surface area, depth of injury, and the presence or absence of inhalational injury. So in terms of total body surface areas, the rule of nines, if you're not aware of that, and that basically ascribes about 9% of surface area to various uh, parts of the body. So 9% for each of the upper extremities, 18% for each of the lower extremities, 18% for the front and back of the torso, and 9% for the face. How does that change in the pediatric population? I mean, essentially what you have is smaller contributions from the extremities, and they tend to be uh, smaller in kids uh, relative to their torso and their face. And again, as well for infants, uh, similar trend there. So smaller contributions from the extremities. Uh, major burns are classified as full thickness burns that comprise greater than 10% of uh, uh, total body surface area. Partial thickness burns that comprise greater than 25% in adults or greater than 20% at the extremes of age. Any burns in the face, hands, feet, or perineum are considered major burns. Um, electrical, chemical, or inhalational burns, again, are by definition considered major burns, and those that are incurred in patients with significant coexisting medical disease. So cardiovascular effects of burn injury, things to know. Okay, so early in a burn injury, cardiac output decreases, SVR increases, coronary blood flow decreases, and the response to um, iatrogenically uh, administered epinephrine and norepinephrine decreases. Late in burn injury, and we're talking about greater than 24 to 48 hours, cardiac output tends to increase and SVR tends to drop. So the bottom line is early, within the first 24 hours of burn, significant burn injury, your patient behaves as though they're significantly hypovolemic. High SVR, low cardi cardiac output state, okay? Uh, 24 hours out, 48 hours out, they behave like they're septic, okay? So they have a very low global systemic vascular resistance with a high cardiac output state. Um, mainstay of management includes the Parkland formula, which addresses fluid repletion in these patients because there's so much uh, surface area that allows for insensible losses of fluid. And that uh, is comprised by the administration of lactated ringers, okay, in the first four, uh, 24 hours, four cc's per kilo times a percent by surface area burned, half given in eight hours, the other half given in the next 16, followed by the administration of albumin. 0.4 cc's per kilo times the percent body surface area burned in the second 24 hours. Which of the following characterizes the major adverse side effect of using 3% hypertonic saline as a resuscitation fluid in major burn victims? So the correct answer is renal failure. Um, the idea is that, uh, of course, you have to improve fluid circulation and euvolemia and tonicity in patients that are losing fluid through uh, burn injured tissues. Um, the use of 3% hypertonic saline has been used uh, and investigated in the past. Um, however, 
Uh, it's an enormous chloride load and uh, hypertonic load that induces intense renal, renal vas vasoconstriction and as a result reduces overall integrity of oxygen consumption and renal function. Um, and in a patient that already has circulatory compromise from extensive burn injury, that's not something that's very productive, as you can imagine. So renal failure is a significant risk of using hypertonic solutions for patients with burn injury. So it's four times, fourfold increase in renal failure um, and increase in mortality with the use of this compared to conventional crystalloid. Um, other adverse effects do include hypernatremia and um, intracellular water uh, depletion. So uh, significant burn, patients with significant burn injuries may represent a patient population in which um, the use of a pulmonary artery catheter may prove beneficial, okay? And part of the reason for that is that when you look at the patient clinically, it's hard to correlate clinical parameters such as vital signs and urine output and what's happening to central cardiovascular parameters, okay, oxygen consumption, cardiac index, SVO2, things like that, okay? And the idea is, is that vital signs may be normal in patients who are actually hypovolemic or transitioning from that hypovolemic to septic type of physiology. Um, in the initial post-burn period, uh, circulatory shock is attributed to hypovolemia, but after 48 hours, that hyperdynamic effect starts to ensue, as I described earlier. And that's where uh, pulmonary artery catheters may be able to uh, help you identify how to manage these patients as they transition from one phase to the next. So moving on to inhalational effects uh, of burn injury. Um, these are a variety of different flow volume loops. Uh, which of the following is most characteristic of early inhalational burn injury? So the correct answer here in this case is on the lower uh, right hand side, okay? So what you see the flow volume loop, the top half of it is expiration, the bottom half of it is inspiration. So initially in inhalational burn injury, the inspiratory effort um, tends to be compromised due to um, a, a lot of uh, tracheal edema uh, that narrows the airway and the inability to um, inspire significantly. That transitions into uh, what looks like fixed upper airway obstruction that compromises the expiratory limb of this flow volume loop as well. And that's when you get a lot of the um, uh, distal bronchiolar edema and sloughing off of tissues distally that uh, affect compliance and the ability for the patient to expire effectively. There also tends to be an element of bronchospasm there as well. Um, if inhalational injury is suspected, uh, the default setting should be to consider elective tracheal intubation despite how good the patient may look because they could devolve rapidly over time. Succinylcholine, I did mention this earlier, you know, uh, again, we think about uh, uh, using succinylcholine until you're 24 hours out, out of burn injury, then it's considered contraindicated. But again, if you got extensive burn injury, uh, across a very large uh, surface area, um, you may consider avoiding it even at the 12 hour or even six hour mark because extrajunctional cholinergic receptor uh, evolution occurs very early uh, in, at post injury. Uh, with neuromuscular blockers, um, understand that because of those extrajunctional cholinergic receptors, they're going to need an increased dose uh, to maintain paralysis. Hematologic sequela of burn injury. Um, initially, there's a high uh, hematocrit due to hemoconcentration from the hypovolemia that results in a chronic anemia of disease over time. Platelets uh, are sequestered and there is a thrombocytopenia that develops. All this sort of returns to normal by one week unless multi-organ system failure is present in which they can develop DIC um, thromboses and um, diffuse microvascular bleeding. Um, coagulation is at first uh, in a hypocoagulable state, but again, these patients are at high risk for deep vein thrombosis over time. So risk factors for inhalational injury include close space fire or entrapment. Uh, facial burns, carpenter sputum, and respiratory distress are clinical signs that are very suspicious for inhalational injury. Initial evaluation should include what you would expect it to be, which includes arterial blood gas analysis.
um, to assess PO2, SAO2, carboxyhemoglobin, and methemoglobin values, um, cyanide values as well. Fiber optic bronchoscopy, chest radiography would be incorporated into man management strategies initially for this as well. So symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, this is something you should focus on, and this is a graded um, uh, stratification of carbon monoxide levels. Under 20%, they have nonspecific symptoms of headache and tinnitus. Between 20 to 40%, they uh, present to be weak and drowsy. Greater than 40%, you're going to see significant CNS disturbances, possibly devolving into coma. Um, and greater than 60% is largely considered fatal. So with carbon monoxide poisoning, oximeters, pulse oximeters will overestimate the O2 saturation. Um, so the O2 dissociation curve ultimately shifts to the left. Okay, So the O2 tends to bind a lot tighter uh, to the hemoglobin, um, making it less available to uh, the tissues because of that carbon monoxide displacement. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin um, about, without, about 200 times as much affinity as oxygen does. So ultimately, the treatment is to displace the CO uh, with oxygen. And you can generally do that effectively by administering high flow 100% O2. Um, in extreme cases, you could put the patient in a hyperbaric chamber, but that's rarely indicated, usually by applying high flow 100% O2. You can reduce the half-life of carbon monoxide significantly to something on the order of 30 minutes. Moving on to cyanide poisoning. Cyanide poisoning after inhalational burn injury can be treated by all the following except which one? So the correct answer is thiocyanate. So um, cyanide toxicity presents itself in the context of burn injury as well as sodium nitroprusside toxicity. So we're going to kind of go over this um, step by step. Cyanide itself uh, causes methemoglobinemia. It also binds to the methemoglobin that it creates um, and creates cyanomethemoglobin. And we'll talk about why that's significant in just a second. Normal disposition for cyanide is to go through the liver okay, and be processed by an enzyme known as rhodinase using a cofactor known as sodium thiosulfate. That produces thiocyanate, okay? And that thiocyanate is renally excreted. So if you have a patient with renal failure, okay, thiocyanate toxicity may uh, be significant, a significant issue in patients with ongoing cyanide poisoning. Okay, so thiocyanate basically causes an alteration in CNS function, uh, delirium, coma, possibly seizures. That's distinct from cyanide poisoning in and of itself, which is even far worse, uh, because ultimately cyanide um, uh, basically puts a monkey wrench in the works in terms of oxidative phosphorylation of cellular tissue beds. It shuts down oxidative phosphorylation, creating a state of tissue hypoxia. Even though there's plenty of oxygen around, the tissues can't use it. It's poisoning the mitochondria. So as a result, uh, it increases anaerobic respiration, metabolic acidosis, lactate production, decreased pH, and an increase in SVO2. Remember that SVO2 is going to increase because all that oxygen that's floating around in the body can't be used. So treatment strategies for cyanide poisoning include three different options. One, you can intentionally induce methemoglobinemia in these patients. And that's why the cyanide antidote kit contains sodium nitrite or amyl nitrite. Okay, That, that induces methemoglobinemia in the purpose of that is to allow the cyanide that's floating around to bind to the methemoglobin and create cyanomethemoglobin. Of course, methemoglobinemia itself is a state of a hyperoxidant state of the iron atom in hemoglobin, which decreases the ability for oxygen to bind. So it's not exactly the most ideal option here. Um, the other idea is if the reason the patient is cyanide toxic is because there's been depletion of sodium thiosulfate, you can give sodium thiosulfate to the patient that's contained in the antidote kit. Of course, if the patient has renal dysfunction, this may not be the best option because that will generate more thiocyanate, which will accumulate. The best option is probably giving vitamin B12. Hydroxycobalamin can be given to these patients and that binds to the cyanide. It's basically a molecular sink, which binds it and takes it away. It's harmless. Cyanide 
cobalamin is basically the end result of this. And lastly, methemoglobin. So I want you to keep all these in line here. Carbon monoxide versus cyanide versus methemoglobin uh, all produce very similar signs and symptoms, um, but they're very different entities. Methemoglobin is basically when the iron atom is in the three plus state, and that disallows the ability of oxygen to bind to it. So it's a hyperoxidant, artificially hyperoxidant state of hemoglobin. It's not always pathologic. We're exposed to uh, oxidant injury throughout the day, every day of our lives. Uh, so a small amount of methemoglobin is normal for everybody. And uh, red blood cells are uniquely susceptible to this because they don't have mitochondria and, or they don't have um, uh, uh, a nucleus that can produce cellular uh, mechanisms and enzymatic mechanisms to deal with this. Okay. Um, so the natural history of methemoglobinemia uh, is ultimately the conversion back to normal hemoglobin through native reductive pathways. Uh, methemoglobin reductase is the main enzyme that does that. As you can see, the, the degrees of methemoglobinemia produce symptoms that are virtually identical to carbon monoxide poisoning. So there's really nothing diagnostic about this. You have to measure the levels of methemoglobin and cyanide and carbon monoxide to figure out what's going on with the patient. So summary of considerations for anesthetic management of the burn injury patient, strong considerations for upper airway injury and the need for elective tracheal intubation and bronchoscopy. Plumbary and systemic edema uh, from uh, fluid dysregulation from loss of oncotic pressure. Uh, low cardiac, high SVR state to transition to a hypovolemic shock type of picture. Um, significant uh, re dysregulation of central thermostat. CO2, carbon dioxide poisoning, um, hypermetabolic states, GI ulcerations over time and renal failure due to hypoperfusion uh, in that sepsis-like picture. Uh, significant um, uh, impaired cellular immunity, which results in an infectious risk. Obviously, a lot of associated comorbidities and injuries specific to the patient. Management of neuromuscular blockers accordingly, which uh, imposes contra contraindications on the use of succinyl choline and increased uh, dosage requirements for non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and significant um, multimodal strategies to achieve adequate pain control. Okay, move on to the last section um, involving the uh, uh, survey of uh, chemical agents of biowarfare. Uh, which of the following would be the best treatment strategy for mass casualties poisoned with sarin gas? The correct answer in this situation is pralidoxime. Um, sarin gas is uh, an anticholinesterase, which produces a lot of cholinergic symptoms. Um, so uh, what you want is an antidote that will kick these uh, molecules off the anticholinesterase uh, anti uh, enzyme. Notice that I put glycopyrrolate on there, which is an anticholinergic, which would also help treat the symptoms, but that does not cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, which you really want in atropine. So the antidote kit for uh, sarin gas actually contains pralidoxime and, um, and atropine. So if I had put atropine in this, set, in this question, would that have been the better answer? It really depends on how they word it, okay? Uh, you know, more often than not, if you're trying down to those two choices, pick the pralidoxime because that's the def definitive treatment for sarin gas poisoning. Now, if they present a clinical stem in which the patient has AV block, okay, severe bradycardia with hypotension and, you know, ongoing syncope and lack of perfusion, okay, so related to that bradycardia from the, you know, cholinergic excess then clearly the thing to do is immediately treat with atropine because that will work within seconds, right? And then um, uh, co-treat with pralidoxime. You know, typically as anesthesiologists, we don't do things in series. We do things in parallel. Um, but that doesn't stop the ABA board examiners from asking questions in that fashion, which is very annoying. I get it. Um, but if I had put atropine up there, the better answer is still pralidoxime unless they give a clinical stem that's very compelling for the need to treat life-threatening bradycardia. So chemical agents of biowarfare uh, categorized into nerve agents, uh, these anticholinesterase agents that I've been talking about, which we'll discuss in a second. Pulmonary uh, agents that uh, cause severe uh, pulmonary injury in ARDS uh, due to the evolution of um, uh, acid, uh, imposed acid content in the lungs. Uh, blood alkylating agents and vesicants.
So nerve gas agents, uh, like I said, are anticholinesterases, and acetylcholine thereby accumulates at muscarinic and nicotinic uh, receptors. Uh, these are clear, colorless liquids that vaporize at room temperature and can penetrate the skin, clothing, or epithelium of the lungs or GI tract. So very effective, very, very, very effective toxins. Uh, with muscarinic stimulation, patients experience what you might expect, okay? Uh, pupillary GI constriction, bradycardia, increased lacrimation, salivation and urination, and excessive diaphoresis. Nicotinic stimulation, okay, at the sympathetic chain, okay, remember that's uh, the prototypical receptor at the sympathetic chain, leads to tachycardia and hypertension at the preganglionic site and fasciculations at the motor end units with twitching and fatigue and flaccid paralysis uh, over time. Okay, uh, which wins out the nicotinic stimulation in, in tachycardia versus the bradycardia uh, really is highly variable. So excessive parasympathetic activity, again, also leads to excessive meiosis and loss of accommodation. So patients complain of blurred vision. The respiratory system, uh, system you can imagine, this causes uh, uh, imposed risk of bronchospasm. Um, this is the dumbbells mnemonic that you remember from medical school that is a result of uh, acetylcholine excess. So treatment for nerve agent poisoning, as I mentioned, is atropine as well as pralidoxime. Um, and uh, both are contained in the antidote kit and just put it in context of what I told you of uh, how the question stem is worded and make your best judgment as far as which one to pick. Uh, your default uh, gut reaction should be to pick the polydoxine. So if you anticipate exposure to nerve gas, um, what's also contained in the kit is um, uh, peridostigmine. And you might wonder why would someone who might be exposed to an agent that's an anticholinesterase go ahead and take another anticholinesterase? Okay, um, well the idea is you're basically blocking acetylcholinesterase to a mild degree, okay? And, and thereby preventing the sarin gas, for example, okay, from binding to it, okay, um, and allows the enzyme to spontaneously regenerate, okay. So that's why um, people going into the field expecting uh, potential exposure to this gas might take this drug. Okay, so I know it sounds a little non-intuitive, but that's why. So moving on to pulmonary agents, uh, things like phosgene uh, and related uh, toxins. The bottom line, phosgene is basically a carbonyl group with two chloride atoms attached. Uh, and basically, once they are within the vicinity of water and in a humid environment, as you can imagine in the lungs, the, the chloride um, is highly reactive and binds to the water generating uh, hydrochloric acid. So it's a way to expose um, an inhalational agent to someone. And as it gets in the lungs, it continually forms hydrochloric acid. And you can imagine just how uh, destructive that is to the um, pulmonary uh, bronchioles. So uh, the downstream effect of this ultimately, as you can imagine and predict, is the development of ARDS. Okay. So the management of these patients is essentially no different than managing any other cause of ARDS. So these patients uh, immediately begin coughing and exhibit some uh, constellational symptoms like vomiting and so forth. They tend to be a little bit free of some abnormalities, which gives them a false sense of hope for the first few hours. But over time, what's happening is that the pulmonary capillary membrane um, is continually being destroyed. And eventually, you get uh, the transposition of fluid into the alveolar line, the development of acute lung injury. So under those conditions, you'd employ lung protective strategies. These patients may need ventilatory support with low uh, peak airway pressures and six to uh, seven cc's uh, per kilo tidal volumes um, and just enough oxygen to support uh, a sufficient PO2 tension and permissive hypercapnia. Um, and that's pretty much what I've outlined on this slide here. So blood agents are cyanogens, okay, hydrogen cyanide, uh, potassium cyanide. Uh, these are very effective drugs uh, and a very high mortality rate if they're not treated. And as I mentioned in the previous section on cyanide poisoning, um, these agents basically poison the mitochondria. They uh, stop oxidative phosphorylation um, and thereby create an anaerobic uh, mode of respiration for cellular tissue beds, which is obviously very inefficient and predisposes to lactic acidosis.
And so um, refer back to that slide on treatment of cyanide poisoning because that's essentially what you would do for patients that are exposed to these types of agents. Vesicants are alkylating agents, things like mustard gases and things like that. The, these are agents that um, ultimately uh, really throw a monkey wrench in the works in terms of uh, forming uh, covalent bond linkages with a variety of different substances, not the least of which include nucleic acids and proteins. Uh, they can be uh, inhaled or ingested through the GI tract, um, and symptoms sort of uh, start to smolder after about uh, uh, 24 hours or so. And mild poisoning results in nonspecific symptoms like eye pain, tearing, um, erythema, and inflammation of the skin, um, irritation of the mucous membranes, coughing, and sneezing. Um, with mild degrees of poisoning, it doesn't really warrant anything more than supportive care, um, and uh, the toxins will pass with time. Larger amounts of mustard, uh, uh, sulfur mustard uh, type of toxins cause considerable dysfunction. Individuals uh, can have very severe symptoms um, that incapacitate them. Um, and those who develop, uh, who go on to develop respiratory compromise are managed as they would with the inhalation of any other toxic agent that develop acute lung injury or ARDS. So uh, that rounds out the discussion of biologic agents of warfare. You can find further discussion in Barrish. They actually have a pretty good treatment of this particular topic for the written board exam. Thank you.